Hi there. Thanks for coming along to our breakfast event to uh, showcase some of our micro learning speakers around project and program management. Um, we're not quite ready yet. We're still sorting things out, getting the technology up and running so we can all be ready for you. So in the meantime, have a look at a few of these snippets um, and it'll give you a bit of a taster as to some of the other uh, micro learning modules that we've got, some of the speakers we've got coming up in store over the next 12 months. Thanks so much. Talk to you soon. Cheers. Projects uh, in uh, the OGC world, in MSP and Prince uh, world, exist to deliver outputs. And what do we mean by it? Oh, PMI calls them deliverables. It's a thing. Usually it means you can have your photograph taken next to it. You know, you can, if you can tap it, it's an output. Risks and issues on programs. So when you've got a whole load of things on your risk register, have a look through them and go, well, what are the causes that we have? What are the big answers to lots of these things? But it's useful to say, am I looking at an effect or a cause when you're looking at the risk register? Thanks for uh, coming back. Uh, we're still getting the cameras ready. Uh, we're still getting everyone positioned so we can do the, um, the broadcast really well for you. So um, we'll have a look at the a uh, few more of these micro learning um, snippets. Uh, so you get a bit of a taster of what's in store. Um, again, talk to you soon. Thanks for hanging by. Cheers. What are the benefits of vaccinating children against flu? Well, presumably it means the kids don't get flu. They can go to school. Their exam scores uh, improve. Their education uh, improves. They don't give flu to other kids at school. That's good. That's a benefit. It's a measurable improvement. We can measure the amount of days that kids have off school because they do measure it. We can do this stuff. A team member may say something like, this new project is negatively affecting our team and that's not being taken into consideration at all. So an active listener could respond by reflecting back. What I'm hearing you say is this new project will have negative con consequences for your team. So I'm not parroting back, I'm reflecting back what I'm hearing in my own words. Oh, hi, uh, thanks very much again for joining us. Um, now, uh, we're just showing you a few of these snippets, so you've got a bit of a taster of what the, um, the micro learning is all about. Um, we've got a couple of presenters coming up shortly um, to uh, speak to you. Um, it's all sort of around the micro learning of the project and program managers. So we're still getting the lights all sorted and um, getting the microphones on and things like that. So just bear with us um, for a few more moments and um, you should be good to go, okay? so. We'll um, definitely be seeing you soon. Cheers. Project, Program and Portfolio Management Maturity Model, P3M3 Maturity Levels. So at level one maturity, which we call awareness, yeah, so there's kind of a process awareness, um, they are kind of the fun places to work, right? Because every project's exciting for them because they've got no idea what's going to happen. Establishing an Enterprise Project Management Office. One of the key things is spending a lot of time on problem definition 
understanding and obviously the same for projects, right? What are we actually trying to resolve here? Are we all clear? Are we all agreed? It takes a lot of time to do that. I don't know. Is, is this the right table? I can't work it out. Look, um, we're going to be um, we're going to be just uh, taking a little bit longer to get this ready. We've got a few cables here that we're not quite sure where they need to go. Um, but once we've got those in, we'll um, we'll all be up and running. So, look, keep enjoying yourself watching these micro learning uh, snippets. They'll um, they'll no doubt give you a bit of uh, knowledge around project and program management. So, um, yeah, talk to you soon. Cheers. Ponder this, we typically divide projects into work packages. We divide programs into projects. There's inevitably an overlap. Should I run a big complicated project with big complicated work packages? Or should I run a simple program with specific projects in it? One person's big complicated work package is another person's simple project and organizations will make different choices. Multiple diverse infections. When they scan your temperature, if it was above 37 or something, you were a potentially polar carrier. Now, the problem is in a country like Sierra Leone, you, your humidity is hot. We're right in the midst of malaria season. And then you've got huge HIV cases going on as well. Kia ora whanau to those in New Zealand, Australia and beyond. Welcome to the CC Learning Networking event. We bring project professionals to you from around the world to share ideas, learnings and experiences in project management. I'm broadcasting from Brisbane, Australia. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Yagara people and the Turbal people of Mianjin and pay my respects to elders past and present. I pay my respects to the Yagara and Turbul elders past, present and emerging who pass their culture and knowledge through oral storytelling, song and dance. There's no dancing or singing planned today. Although Andy's short video welcoming you had a bit of a funky sound behind it. We will however use oral storytelling to share with each other the wisdom and knowledge gained from experiences in project management. And that way we hope to blend cultures and histories together. So I extend a, uh, a warm welcome to Andy um, from the banks of the River Dee in West Kirby in the world, north of England. Not far from Thor's, Thor's Stone. I, I was just saying to Andy, I thought that Thor's Stone was a place where we went for a jog way back in May, but, um, but apparently that wasn't the case. I got pretty close though. I have not gone and put my name to the stone apparently to sandstone so apparently that's a common activity is that right andy <laughs> that's right yeah so the young lovers inscribe their names into the rock um to leave an indelible sort of record of their once relationship <laughs> <laughs> the past a record yeah. of the past in sandstone not exactly a a a, a, a note forever though is it so yeah, that's true yeah um so i'm broadcasting brisbane on a well, actually, quite a beautiful afternoon. There's no, there's no rain here. There's, uh, it's looking pretty, uh, pretty sunny. We're heading our way into spring, which is kind of nice. Um, and uh, soon we're going to have a scorching summer, I suspect, based on the northern hemisphere's experiences and uh, and your experiences when you were holidaying. Did you get much sun? Is it very hot and sweltery where you were? A couple of weeks yeah, ago? Well, we uh, just back from holiday in northern France, and um, fortunately, it was. Um, it was very pleasant. It, we, we we missed the heat waves and the uh, and, and the shocking weather in you know, further south in, in Europe at the moment with the numerous wildfires that, that we're experiencing. Um, and I know you guys have uh, had more than your fair share of that as well. But uh, yeah, very very pleasant holiday. Thanks, Scott. 
Yeah, that's for sure. I think um, wildfires have become a bit of a, an expertise over here in Australia um, with regards to dealing in those. Um, so the today today's um, format is I'm going to ask Andy a few questions about the behind-the-scenes action in the development of Prince 2 version 7. Um, for those joining us live, please ask questions via YouTube. I've got a computer to the side here that I'll be glancing at every now and then to see if I can see anyone making comments. And if they are, I'll, I'll, I'll pose those to Andy. Um, and um, please um, continue the conversation after this into your workplace. If you're watching a recording of this, please get others, share it with others, get other people to have a look because um, further discussions about project management and the way projects are delivered and how we can improve them through um, iterations, for example, of Prince2 is a great way to go. So um, look, I'll start with the questions then, Andy. Might as well get right into it. Yep. Um, first question, can you, or rather just can you give us a, um, a bit of a, a background or, a, or an imagination of where things are at? You know, how did you... Um, can you give us an idea of the team size you worked with, um, how you managed the workload, and if COVID affected your timelines? Just a little bit of an overview of the project itself. How long does it take to do a revision of, of Prince 2? Um, is that easy yeah, to Yeah, it's a great, great, great <laughs> opening question, Scott. So um, uh, interestingly, the, 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 you know, I was involved in the development of the 2009 version of Prince 2. I was lead author for that iteration, and I spent... Um, quite a bit of time ahead of assembling the team, um, working with um, what was um, OGC at the time, um, doing the research, getting the feedback, and then shaping effectively the requirement of the update. And, and that work was about six, six months or, or so. Uh, and this project followed the same pattern. So I was appointed ahead of the rest of the authoring team. Um, and like the previous one, it involved some research, um, a lot of which had already been done by um, Axlos or now, now PeopleCert. Um, so you know, at the point I was appointed, there was already a sort of a, a dossier of, of information for, for me to review. Um, but that lasted nearly nine months um, this time around of, of considering what we wanted to do, shaping the specification for the scale of the update. Was it going to be a light touch edit or was it going to be uh, more, more significant? Um, the reason for that is that when we know the shape of what the update's likely to look like, we can then think about the talent we need in the development team. Um, so we only appoint the rest of the authoring team once we know what the exam question is, so to speak. Um, there was a difference this time round to my last experience as well, in that at this time we uh, worked very closely with the examinations team. Um, in the 2009 version, uh, the decision was taken quite early on, just to focus on uh, you know, describing the method in a way that people can use it don't worry about how it can be tested for demonstrating competence or understanding of, of the methods. So the examinations were deliberately kept separate from the authoring work. This time round, uh, we worked hand in glove. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that we've written it for examination, um, but we did develop the syllabus really early on in parallel to that specification piece that I mentioned. So once we knew what the in that research what the shape of it was going to look like, syllabus was put together uh, very shortly after and then that informed the final tweaks and then the appointment of the the authoring team um, the benefit of that and, and i think it, the feedback we're getting uh, from the review process is that um there's there's a an approach that's taken with the examinations in terms of how the scenarios are put together and how the um the, the balance of the different types of questions this is the blooms level of of, of questions such that you don't overload learners in what they call the sort of the cognitive load. So what we want to do is to be able to, all types of learners, to be able to study, understand, and then demonstrate their competence um, in, in the method um, without being burdened by too many concepts all at the same time or, or uh, too many new terms coming along together. So. Uh, I think the sort of the uh, um, the benefit of what we've done working really closely with the examinations team 
is something I really wanted to do in the 2009 version when we talked about plain English. It was a mantra that I, I rammed into the team at the time. Keep it simple, keep it simple. If 10 words is better than 20, you know, we're really you know, trying to strip it down just to make it easier to read. Uh, and by working with the examinations team this time, we, we've achieved that uh, much better than we did in the 2009 version. Do you feel as though that will help with um, broader adoption across the world? I mean, you know, Prince 2 is written in English to start with and then translated into other mm -hmm. languages. Um, you know, the English-speaking world, while English is often considered to be the lingua franca um, of, the world, of the business world, um, it's certainly not. Um, you know, Chinese um, mm -hmm. is very popular in a large parts of um, Asia um, and being down this part of the world in Asia-Pacific, um, we're quite wary of Indonesia as well. Um, there's some pretty large um, bodies of people, bodies of um, projects. You know, everyone's doing projects. So I wonder whether or not there was that sort of concept. Was there any involvement in language authors or language consultants other than English in the process? Um, that there has been, um, but the but not from a designed to translate. Um, but one of the things that we do through the authoring and then the review process is to reduce um, the number of synonyms uh, in the uh, in, in the manual in, in the book. So you know one of the um, flexibilities, if you like, of, um, of of the English language is is that we have you know a luxury choice of words <laughs> that mean the same thing, uh, and you know in school. You know, we're taught in terms of creative writing to avoid rep you know repetition. So, you know, so that's why you know in, in English, in plain English, plan and schedule can mean the same thing. Um, in a technical document, it, they shouldn't. Um, and then when you're translating, you know, uh, into a foreign language, you know, having these words that um, appear similar but that may not be similar causes quite a lot of challenge for for translation. So. We, we, we do focus on avoiding those uh, alternative use of terms when we already have a term. Um, the other thing that we avoid uh, is you know, where we have just plain English, um, we use dictionary definitions um, as the primacy, so that takes priority. Um, where we want to define something, we'll then look to ISO um, standards, uh, and then we look to the the rest of the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of the P3M product suite, you know, MSP, MOR, and so on, so that we're consistent across the, the products. There is a hierarchy of the terms that we use, and we try to avoid defining too many new terms when just the plain English understanding of a word is sufficient. Um, so the the number of terms in the in the in the, in the glossary is, is reduced uh, as well. Um. So. Changing tact a bit now. Um, so behind the scenes, uh, what methodology did you use to deliver the revision? Did you use Prince 2 or did you decide to not use the methodology? Yeah, well, interestingly, we used the overarching um, was, was Prince 2. So, you know, it, it, it followed the, um, you know, we, we had stages and we had you know, the review points in, in good practice. Uh, we did do a product outline, a product description, um, in terms of the, the overall specification. Um, and then we did, a in terms of the individual, uh, when we broke the, the, the project product down in terms of the authoring, uh, the, the authored product, if, if you want to talk of it in that way, um, we used storyboarding. So we actually brought in a fair bit of, um, of, of agile techniques as well in terms of how we set up some of the sprints and, and the iterations that we used in the way that Prince2 um, encourages you know that use you know, where it's appropriate. Um, so yeah, so we, we you know we, we we tailored our use of it appropriate for a you know, a development project where the output is a is a book. Very cool. Now um, there's a new aspect of project performance um, sustainability. So um, before we go into what sustainability is and what's it got to do with it. Um, Tell us what an aspect of project performance is. Yeah, so actually I'll wind it back a little bit 
before answering that that question, okay. Scott. So yeah, I mentioned that sort of uh, long lead of, um, of of research that that we did, um, and that included horizon scanning of you know just what, what what's going on in the world of projects, um, uh, and also the feedback from existing users. And importantly, we got feedback from non-users, so we're not just sort of um, responding to our own echo chamber as to you know why those people who, who've chosen not to use Prince2 and what was it? Was it a perception issue? Was it that they try it and it just didn't fit or they found it too difficult? To, you know, so we had that rich mix. Um, and in terms of that horizon scan, you know, the you know, top of the list was the, um, you know, the, the ubiquity of, of sustainability in terms of, um, of, of the challenges. So, so you know, it, you know, to update you know, Prince2 and not address sustainability head on uh, would you know it was just it would have been um, you know foolish really um, so it was a, it was a very easy decision to you know, to bring in the sustainability in, into prince 2 but in terms of the performance targets um, you know uh, projects um, you know sort of a, a characteristic that we have is that we we we, you know, we produce a plan and then we set up some controls to you know to keep the project to that plan and Prince2 uh, has uh, sort of inbuilt um, uh, performance targets for plans around uh, benefits, uh, time, cost, quality, and scope. You know, they've always uh, be, been in there. And uh, we set tolerances for those so that you know, there's a, a degree of flex or movement uh, on, in your controls so you're not constantly reacting and responding to very small movements. Uh, of a plan. So that's how Prince2 set up in terms of setting these performance targets, the tolerances against it, getting continual uh, um, uh, updates on where you are against the plan, uh, you know, with those uh, targets and, and then adjusting so you land on that lily pad, if you like, at the end of the, of the project or you, you'd land on the right part of the runway if you're coming in to, 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 to land. Um, and that is the, the concept. And so if you think about it, I mean, I always think about those performance targets more as levers, um, that they're levers that the, the project uh, manager and the rest of the project team, the board, uh, have available to them to, to, to adjust. So, um, you know, in terms of do you need uh, a, bit, a bit more time or, you know, would you like a bit more scope because you've made more progress um, than you had anticipated. So these are things that you can pull in, you know, to adjust and fine tune the project when you go from that very, um, you know, uncertain, ambiguous stage very early on in the project. And as you progress, things become less ambiguous and, and more certain. So they're, they're great levers that I think that, that can be used to uh, to help control the project. Um, and these levers require trade offs. Um, so if you pull one lever, lever, it impacts the others. And so the art of project management is one of making continual trade-offs in the things that you want to achieve. And one of those has to be sustainability. Um, so when we looked at including sustainability um, into Prince2, it, it was you know, the, the obvious thing to do was to make sustainability one of the um, one of those performance targets. And in anticipation of your next question, <laughs> what do we mean by sustainability? Um, so it would be very easy for us to just, you know, change that to carbon. You know, so if you think about it in terms of the, the current focus we have on net zero with, um, you know, governments around the world agreeing to the 2050 target uh, agreed at the Paris um, COP um, and, and many governments bringing that forward. So the UK, we, we have it as a 2035 um, target. Um, so that's what that's enshrined in our legislation. So we put it into law that that's what we are um, going to achieve. Um, then, you know, carbon could have been just a straightforward, you know, we're balancing the time, the cost and the amount of carbon that the project's using. Um, but in terms specific, of... specific though, right? Too specific. It is too specific. I mean, you know, um, why is it, why uh, only carbon? Why not like effluent? Why not uh, to the electricity? You know, it's like yeah, or, or, or biodiversity. Um, mm. So you know, if you think about um, you know just crudely, um, you know, the, the reducing our carbon and, and meeting that net zero target is going to ensure that we have a, a planet to live on. Um, you know, 
reversing the biodiversity loss is going to ensure that we have a planet worthwhile living on. So, so we yeah. need to do both. You can't just do do one uh, over the other. And interestingly, um, in terms of biodiversity, so um, yeah, as part of the, sort of the uh, the research, um, there's a uh, I, I went along to um, it was a launch of a, a charity event. So three of the largest charities in the UK um, uh, came together in in response to the David Attenborough series of films um, uh, called Our Wild Isles. I don't know if you've seen that, uh, looking at the, the, the biodiversity of the UK. And in that series of films, they talked mm. about, so for example, wild meadows, we've only got 3% of the wild meadows uh, in the UK that we had uh, in, in the 1940s. So that's a shocking wow. degree of loss. Uh, and in the part of that, that series, one of the things they covered is that post-war, there was something called the Green Revolution. Um, that, that was the title of it. But, but essentially it was how does uh, the UK as a country ensure it can feed itself so that it's not having to ration in the way that it did uh, in, the, in the Second World War. So uh, there was a, a program of transformation program, a government-led transformation program to transform farming so that we produce significantly more food with significantly less land. Now, interesting. We now produce eight times more food than we did back in you know, the 1940s, with something like a third of the land. What's come with that, though, is that we took all our hedgerows out and made these really large fields, and and, right, and so on. Yeah. So, so that one initiative, which was about you know, can we make sure we can feed ourselves, actually was the biggest contributory factor to biodiversity loss in the UK. So sometimes we can be so focused on one narrow target mm. as a species that we then cause subsequent issues. So uh, I, anyway, so I, a bit of a... a, bit of I, a sus uh, I suspect your average, you, no, no matter who you speak to, you know, your average IT project manager or your average um, construction engineer will be able to cite another example, just as you've described, yeah, where absolutely. there's so, so much focus on one thing. It's like, what yeah. about these things? No, no, it's not irrelevant. Just focus yeah. on this. Yeah, um, I mean, carbon is critical, but it's carbon and rather than carbon mm. only. Um, yeah. So, but the uh, but we we take the the broadest definition of sustainability. So, um, Princeton uses the UN's definition, which they first published back in 1987. Um, mm. And the definition that they use is uh, sustainability is about meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So, you know, it's a really simple definition. Uh, and the UN has put that into 17 sustainable uh, development goals. So the UN SDGs, as they're com you know, commonly referenced as. Mm. And Prince 2 references those uh, explicitly. So we talk about yeah. the 17 SDGs. Um, and then as a part of that performance target, uh, uh, alongside that, Prince 2 now has a sustainability management approach. Um, and it requires... Uh, project teams to think about the sustainability of not just the project work, um, but the sustainability of the project product through the whole life of the project product. So it's the whole life sustainability. So, um, you know, we could do things, for example, um, you know, if, if it's a construction project, you could set out to have a diesel free site. So you've got mm. electric cranes rather than diesel cranes and so on. That's the yeah. sustainability of the project work. But yeah. if you're using Portland cement for all of the structures when you know low carbon concrete could be used instead, then you've got you know a, a product that's less sustainable and you know have increased uh, decommissioning costs at the end and, and so on. So, um, so we, we use the whole of the S SDGs, but that sustainability management approach um, you know prompts you to go and seek um, mm. you know, what are the ESG or the sustainability uh, priorities of the the business that's commissioning mm. the project uh, and the customers or the users and the suppliers involved. So looking at that broader project ecosystem, you know, what are those sustainability mm. drivers or imperatives or targets that exist that the project either needs to operate within or if it's a project that has climate objectives or, or sustainability objectives as, as a, a, you, know, a, you know, if that's what it's about. So, for example, flood defence, um, then, um, you know, how, how does it contribute to the organization's um, sustainability objectives? So, so that, that, that's how we get that alignment between the project and the environment in which the project exists. We've got a question here from Grant Crawford in Wellington. Let me just show that um, to everyone there. 
So uh, Grant Crawford asks, um, will the plain English um, uh, cater for different types of learners and flow into the people set exam? So the concept of you uh, modifying the um, modifying the, the the manual to be more plain English, do you feel that that's going to go through the exams? And um, one of his comments is, because he's a trainer, um, uh, no one in Wellington there, many of the questions rely on English knowledge and reading comprehensive instead of methodology. So really, if you're good at English, you'll do good in those exams as opposed to, um, uh, you know, allowing people to uh, work off the methodology. They've got to sort of understand the, the complex English. Are you Was there any talk with the examination? Um, yeah, team so we did. About that? We did work really closely with um, Michelle Rowland, who, who who led that team and the... Um, the, the um, the, the examinations experts within people search uh, but again coming back to those blooms levels as well so understanding what type of um test we wanted to use against which aspects of the method that we wanted to check understanding of so that that did influence um you know how um how, how we author things but but it, it has a greater influence on the 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 questions um, and in insofar as I think as those two questions um, uh, highlight that when you go through testing of the exam questions and the, um, the the multiple choice answers, what you want to do is to avoid that someone that's not really read the method <laughs> could have a, a good guess. Um, mm. And get a reasonable chance of getting the right answer. So, so they're they're things that that are tested for. So we strip out those questions where um, you've got a good chance of getting a right answer, irrespective of whether you've learned the, the method or not. Um, and, and that relates to that sort of removing. It's just it's not just about comprehension. It's it is about understanding. Yeah, I understand the method. We've got another mm. question. Um, it's not going to appear on the screen, unfortunately. But um, this is from Peter Foster, another trainer. Um, and a good friend, um, having studied the new exams and set both the foundation and practitioner exams, I feel the exams are more difficult. Your thoughts? Um, this is a trainer with 16 years experience, um, past mark increase and exams seem more complex. I don't know if you've, have you been involved in the examination process beyond um, beyond initially doing the, doing the update? Um, and 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 being involved with you know seeing the results back or anything like that, or have, has your involvement stopped at this point and, and that's passed on? To yes, my involvement stopped at the um, you know, the so, so when the um, to to ensure that sort of the launch of the of, of the book um, coincides with the the launch of the training materials and the exams as well. So as you can imagine, we, we were developing you know the the, uh, the content in, in sprints. Um, and then at the point at which there was a reasonable level of maturity in, in the in, in sort of the wireframes and how we, we put together the content, the examinations team then started developing the, the question bank uh, alongside it. And that was really useful as well. I didn't, didn't really pick up on that before because having, you know, an extra, you know, eight pair of eyes <laughs> on, <laughs> on what we've produced with the viewers, can they test someone's understanding of it? they were picking up some of those language uh, challenges and some of those uh, consistency challenges between different chapters to make sure that the, mm. you know, the the method was properly integrated which is what we you know which is my role essentially as the as the lead editor um, so it was really invaluable having them but it stopped there so so it stopped in terms of the examinations team flagging up uh, concerns or issues or, or language challenges and then us as an authoring team you know looking at how we could deal with it and then going back and uh, and, and uh, uh, providing an update um, so I wasn't involved in this sort of the testing or the piloting of the of, of the exams yeah you'll have to apologize too um, I noticed I've, I've actually put you as the lead author which is probably a uh, something that came over from uh, from last time, 2009. So I've just updated that. So I apologize. Yes, yes, lead, lead so editor. Who's seeing Andy as lead author. Um, I've changed it to lead editor, which is the appropriate um, description. Um, so tell me tell me about um, any uh, sort of, I want to say the word controversial, but I'm not trying to say controversial. I'm trying to say uh, items of debate that came up. You know, what was tricky in the background? What discussions 
raised people's, you know, some people can be quite religious about their concepts of what's important, um, rightly so, you know, everyone's got their, their opinion. Um, what was it, do you think, that had to be resolved during the process of getting Prince 2 um, version 7 up and going? Um yeah, it's good. I wasn't anticipating that question, so let me just <laughs> pull it through. Um, thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, so there, there were so we we set out with some design philosophies, um, uh, and you know the sort of the philosophies that we set out is that it had to be true to Prince Two, so people would recognise it as an evolution of of Prince Two, and it's not a case of having to throw away any existing learning or, or, or any existing um, applications of Prince2 in the way that organizations sort of create their in-house uh, um, versions of it. Um, so it had to have that, you know, that, that thread of, of, of alignment. Um, but then there are also um, elements, I think it will be fair to say there's a few things in the method that are a bit like, you know, as humans, we still have an appendix, you know, so it, it served a purpose once, but but it no longer does. Um, and, and there are a few a few items in there that, um, you know, whilst are really useful, um, they're not useful on every single project. Um, and the universal test that we apply, um, which is one of the design philosophies of, of Prince2, that it can be applied to any type of project, um, made us look at some of those. So quality review technique um, mm. is is one of the the casualties that you know you know it's referenced, but but we no longer say it's critical uh, to, to the method. You know any any review technique you know can work. That's one. Um, it, it hasn't got to be the only one that you can use. I uh, I just assumed that was in the. I just assumed that was in there for the exam questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and not used in practice. I mean, I, I, I'm a personally a real fan uh, of the quality <laughs> review technique, and and you know really use it on my projects because it is a really structured and effective way of doing it for some types of products, um, not, not all. So uh, you know, so you can see there that there are you know better ways uh, for, for mm. some uh, for some projects. So hence. It, opening it up so you know project professionals can apply their judgment as to what techniques that they use to support the, the method and, and that's very much how it's been set out that there's some Prince 2 techniques and then there's recommended techniques um, yeah. that support the, the, the Prince 2 practices um, so that that's one um, I think the other one that um, you know had a, a range of um, opinions on um, so one of the significant changes uh, for Prince 2 7 it is the uh, introduction of people as the fifth integrated element of Prince 2. So we've got the principles, the you know the, the processes, the practices, the project context. So we've always had four integrated elements and we've added mm. in people. We put them at the centre. So we talk about people at the heart of the project as well, at the centre of the project. And, and that is a complete shift of approach to previous editions of Prince 2. Um, so in 2009, which is one that obviously I, I led, um, when we looked at, can we bring in things like leadership and management? Because we had that request then, so that was on the shopping list of things to include. Mm. Um, we, we, we struggled and, and we took a decision in 2009 that uh, to meet, to, to part or, or to be consistent with that philosophy of being universal, so being able to apply on any project, we couldn't codify people aspects into the method because they yeah. are uh, culturally oriented. So a leadership style in, in the UK could be quite different to the leadership style in, in, in say, Italy. Or indeed, leadership style in a public sector organisation might be different to leadership style in a, yeah. in a manufacturing private sector you know, yeah. um, context. So, um, so that, that cultural influence over leadership yeah and management meant uh, and, and business change approaches we felt that we couldn't codify in a way that a method sort of mm. leads you to codifying but but we decided this time around we wouldn't duck uh, and we would <laughs> we would take it on uh, and, and i want to i want to mention to be i want to mention everyone to listening um this is actually a sneak preview into our next event on the 5th of september where we're going to be talking about the people section 
and we're going to be going into more detail about it. So uh, Andy's giving you a few little nuggets here. Um, yeah. but definitely join us for that next one in the series um, to be involved in that. Look, I'm just going to do a, a bit of a, a bit of an ad here, a bit of a call out ad um, from our sponsors, namely um, CC Learning. So Jenny, our course admins, asked me to mention a few courses coming up. So there's a few questions to come yet, but um, if your staff are interested in booking on Prince Two benefits or change courses, please let us know. Um, we've got some courses coming up. There's some Prince Two courses um, in Wellington and Auckland. You can attend those remotely. Um, 11th and 25th of September. We've got a Better Business Cases course coming up on the 25th of September as well. Um, change Management on the 2nd of October and an MSP, Managing Successful Programs course coming up in Wellington on the 9th. And we've got some international uh, trainers coming over from the UK and also coming on from Australia. So um, go onto our website and have a look at those. Feel free to phone um, Jenny on 0800 8897 or visit our website. Um, I've got another question for you, um, and I want to sort of steer us uh, a little bit um, in a different direction and ask about, I know you've been getting very involved in the project, using project, or rather encouraging people who are involved in projects to become more data focused. And this is a topic mm -hmm. that we've touched on before. Um, and First of all, it's kind of a two-part question. First of all, I want to know what you were thinking of in the back of your head, because I know this is important for you, when you were looking at Prince2, because you're aware of my attempts of trying to train our chat AI, um, our, mm -hmm. our project management chat assistant, um, using existing documentation and the challenges of doing just basic documentation from organizations. Um, you know, a basic risk register that wasn't only updated during the first few days of the project, um, a, a PID that's actually been updated with what actually happened, which I think is part of the data that we need to be gathering to ensure that we're able to make better decisions in the future, whether that be for lessons learned or integration into a chat assistant. Um, so two parts, I guess. Can you talk to me about whether you considered this concept of data gathering in Prince 2, is there a section? I don't think there's a section on data gathering. Tell me, tell me about it. Yeah, so just got very, you know, it, it, we started this journey in the 2009. So, you know, one of the Prince 2 principles is learning from experience. And there was a lot of research that was um, done to inform that principle at the time. Um, actually, Queensland University of Technology um, did a study that, that informed that right, yeah. <laughs> that informed that as well around the the challenges of uh, of, of using prints too, and, and their conclusion was that um, uh, um, it's it's not the method; it's it's the application of the method that was the, the, the challenge. I exactly what you just said: you know, risk registers being created and not really used. So that's not then really Prince 2 if you've if you've created a risk register and never used it or updated it, because that's not what the method uh, tells you to, to do. But anyway, the, the learning from experience uh, principle um, moved, um, or the intent uh, when we did it, was to move lessons learned from being a push activity. So we review everything that worked well or didn't work well, we put it in a report, and then we sort of, we, 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 we broadcast it um, and then forget about it. Um, so that was the you know the the lessons the push approach to lessons learned that was common um, and, and pretty exclusive um, uh, when we did that that review for the two thousand and nine. Do you think so, sorry sorry to interrupt, but do you, don't you think that lessons learned? I, I mean, what I'm looking at, and I've spoken to probably around about three hundred organisations around their data. Lessons learned is like the icing on the cake for these guys. Oh, yes. They yeah, so, aren't so that's even close to lessons learned. You know, they're, they're just struggling updating the existing documentation, let alone yeah. learning from and, and, what went wrong. Scott, that, that was the point that we had back back then, that when we when we spoke to a similar sort of number of organisations about the challenges of lessons learned, was that, you know, few people read them. Um, so if you think about, you know, the, um, the rewards... Of project management practice, if I, if I can put it this way, yeah. um, it, it is that you do the least amount of work possible to get the job done. That's what project yeah. managers do. 
Uh, and if no one's reading your reports and you stop producing them and no one then asks for them, you never produce them again. That's just human nature. Um, so we did discover that this lack of follow-up um, discouraged project people to properly produce the lessons learned reports at the end. The second aspect is that projects are temporary. Um, so what are project, most project managers doing in the wind down of their project? They're looking for their next one. And if one comes up, they often then move on to it before the project properly closes out. So there's a challenge there as well. So there are some. Is, you know, is this the tyranny of contractors? I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to alienate a section of my customer base. Stop. But is I, it I is that, it contractors that are the problem? No, that happens in house, doesn't it? With project managers wanting to make sure they get the next juicy project, they're always as soon as you get past that 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 wind down, they're they're looking for the next project, and that's just well, why wouldn't you? Um, you want to get the next biggest, juiciest, and most challenging one, um, or so was you might there, want was, to get the next easy one. <laughs> so, was but, there uh, anything on the list? Was there anything on the list that said, "Hey, we want you to talk about data gathering. We want you to talk about evidence-based so, decision making." So, yeah. So, I'll just sort of close that bit out. So that that uh, change to seeking lessons rather than pushing lessons mm. was was a shift, and we we hoped in two thousand nine that that would, if more people are asking for them then they're more likely to be made, you know, produced and made available and so on. But that temporary nature, Scott, I mentioned, does does make data challenging uh, in, in a project context. The other thing that makes data challenging in a project context is the the fact that projects, by their definition, are cross-cutting. If, if, you, um, if, if a project was only within a business unit or a single department or team, and you could do it through your business as usual operational and functional structures, then you should do, because they are strong and robust and the relationships work. So you should only use project management when your business as usual structures can't deliver the, the work. Mm. That's why we use projects. So the very definition of projects means that you're doing something that's not just temporary, but it's working across organizational boundaries and across organizational functions and, 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 and operations. So that creates silos. And you might even yeah, have external contractors uh, and so on. So all of a sudden, we've got a silo issue with, with, with data as well. So we know these are inherent challenges. So when we um, you know, did that casting the net, that, that horizon scan, data did come up. Um, I, I've been working with a, uh, something called the uh, Project Data Analytics Task Force anyway. Um, uh, where there's some principles, there's a, a manifesto for data-driven projects that's been produced. Uh, and that's tackling these sorts of issues around how, how data-poor uh, projects are compared to other types of management disciplines. So, mm. you know, if we were to compare, um, you know, let's, let's imagine that our project was like a manufacturing process. Um, if it was a manufacturing process, we would possibly have you know, a, a hundred a few hundred, maybe even a thousand sensors giving us real-time information about the performance of that manufacturing process. Uh, and that, that manufacturing data will be preserved. So I could go back to see what it was like this time last year um, or three years ago. I could possibly get some benchmarking data across my manufacturing sites or, or indeed externally through an industry association to see how my part of my manufacturing process is performing against others. And through things like Six Sigma continuous improvement, mm. I can look to optimize that because I'm in a data rich environment <laughs> and I can do things with these large language models to you know, do pattern recognition to start that optimization. Mm. You know, that's a challenge in, in projects where um, you know, we, we don't have, well, we typically we've got time cost quality. We don't have thousands of sensors. A typical project dashboard probably has 20 data items on it in truth. Um, mm. Not not a hundred, not a thousand, you know, uh, and the repeat cycle is possibly monthly, um, uh, whereas in a manufacturing it might be minutes, hours. Right. So, yeah, true. You know, so so there, yeah. there's a challenge that we have we have we have here. So um, you know what we've introduced in in Prince Two Seven is the concept of a, a digital and data management approach in the same way that you have a risk management approach, and that requires really early on, you know, when you're doing the uh, the, the, the starting a project process, um, pre-project, uh, in outline to consider the data that the project needs, the data that the project's likely to produce, how you're going to 
um, use it? How are you going to secure it? Uh, how are you going to keep it safe? How are you going to you know, ensure it's got integrity? Um, how, what decisions need to be informed by what data and, and, you know, and then how do you curate that data to, to get better decision making? And within that data management approach, the question is, and what happens to the data when the project completes? So that there are prompts inbuilt to mm. Prince 2 now that are all around data. And then following on from that is, and what digital or technology do you want, does your project need to support that? Do you feel as though you made it clear enough that actually the management of the project as well is the data? Like there's this concept of specialist versus management. Yes, yes. Um, so it covers both both those aspects. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah, and, and, and the emphasis, I think, in... in you know, interesting question. So you know, I could go back over, but I suspect the the emphasis is on the management rather than the specialist. Actually, uh, in terms okay. of the, okay. uh, the the data that we're we're referencing. Okay. So before we close down, I've got another um, comment from Grant um, flying the contractor's flag after my my brash comment earlier. So let's put that on the screen. So Grant says, um, I'd argue contractors should be. Uh, should be the most fussy about good practice closure as the person who does uh, no longer in the company to defend themselves is an easy target to blame, um, but I'm not alienated. So he's, uh, I think I think the, the concept there is contractors have nothing to lose. They may as well, <laughs> they may as well dish the dirt <laughs> so they can move on. Yeah, yeah, or, 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 or produce that sort of closeout documentation so that the... Uh, the record of the projects in their perspective rather than some, <laughs> yeah, someone else's exactly. words. Yeah, 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 I get that. yeah, that, yeah there's, there is a point, I think, about, you know, the person who writes the minutes controls the meeting. I think that's, yes. a, that's another. <laughs> I'll just check over here to see if I need more. doesn't look like we've got any more comments over there. But, um, yeah, look, um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, we are going to be doing a series of this, everybody. So we've got a couple more of these to come at least. Um, and people will be our next one. So feel free to go in and register for those on our website, um, cclearning.cc slash uh, networking-events, um, or just visit our page and you'll get to the right spot. Um, so I'd just like to uh, thank you very much for taking the time um, of being available for us, Andy, using your uh, your morning, no doubt. I don't know if Absolutely. you've got a coffee Thanks yet. for the invite, and uh, <laughs> it was great to hear some familiar, familiar names asking those questions as well. So uh, yeah, uh, it's hello to those guys that I've uh, previously met on my trips to uh, Australia and New Zealand in the past. We, we are going to have to get you back down here again. So for those who have registered, a link to the recording of this event will be sent along with a request to provide us with feedback. Please share the link with others. Please give us feedback. We want to hear what you want to know. Um, thanks for coming. We look forward to seeing you at a future event. Kaki Tafano. Thanks very much. Bye.